they get about 65,000 complaints a year. That's pretty good, except there's only 200 inspectors. That's not enough with which to evaluate where uh, you send them. And so typically when they go off, about 15% of the time, they'll see, see conditions that are so dire that they issue a vacate order. And that's the stiffest, stiffest sanction that you can offer that basically says, get out of the building. Everyone has to go. So now they use big data. And what the big data does is they look at lots of different signals. They look at rodent infestation, power cuts, whether there's a financial lien on the property, ambulance calls to that address. And when they put in all this data into their model, they now can rank from the degree of severity which are the areas, the overcrowded buildings that are worse and about to burst into flames and have a structural fire where people will die versus ones that are just a problem but not as serious. Now when the inspectors go out, they issue a vacate order 70% of the time. That's a five-fold increase in their effectiveness. So if you will, big data is riding to the rescue at some of the issues that we are facing on a day-to-day -day level. Yes, and for those of you listening, you really do need to check out this book because all of these stories are well written and summarized and documented in the back of, of this book. I'd like to move on to um, another story kind of similar to that, also in New York, the manhole um, fire thing? Sure. Sure. Um, a, a very uh, intricate problem uh, uh, was, um, uh, uh, was apparent to the uh, people at the, uh, at the New York Utility Company, uh, namely the fact that um, manholes um, were blowing up, um, uh, dozens of them over the course of the year. Why? Because there are old wires in there, there are old boxes in there, uh, switch boxes in there, and so forth. And uh, they have a whole department that maintains those manholes and tries to make sure that they're uh, well repaired before they blow up. But how do you prioritize if you have thousands of manholes, which manhole to go to? And uh, so they uh, work with Columbia University and a researcher there to uh, use big data analysis to help them. And what they did was to go back to the maintenance records that they had over a century uh, for each of the manholes. And that was data, it was a lot of data, uh, close to all of the data that they had available. But then they had to datafy that, that data, to move, to bring it into a, a form uh, with which uh, you can then do big data analysis. Um, and it was very messy data because different people had different codes and different abbreviations. Um, but they were up, uh, able to do that. They were able to embrace this messiness and then do correlation and analysis to predict which manhole would blow up most likely. And that gave them a tremendous, tremendously better, and tremendously improved sense of priorities of which manholes to tend to first, which uh, is more efficient, but is also uh, safer for New York citizens and for the maintenance personnel uh, that's working for the utility. So it was a win-win situation. Right. It, it actually moves into this, the more business side of all of this. And you use the term, this datafication concept, where many companies are in business doing one thing or another. And of course, they're automated, have been for years. And uh, data is involved. But the data hasn't been set free, as it were. Could you talk a little bit about that concept of datafication and, and, and secondary and tertiary uses of data? And, and then we'll get into this value chain concept. Sure. Yeah. So uh, datafication is quite simple. What it refers to is the fact that we are right now taking things that were always informational, but we never really considered as informational or information, and rendering it into a data form so that we can process it, analyze it, and do new things with it, extract value from it. So an example is perhaps um, how we're sitting right now. Okay, the way that you're sitting and the way that I'm sitting and the way that Victor's sitting is different. It's rare to see two people who would sit exactly the same way because it's about your weight, the distribution of your weight, your leg length, lots of different factors. And if you could imagine if we put maybe 200 sensors behind in the chair and around us on the back, that we could create an index for ourselves that would, if you will, datafy our posture. So what would we do with that? That sounds a little bit silly. Well, the first thing is that this is happening. There are researchers in Tokyo right now who are measuring and, if you will, datafying, putting sensors into car seats as an anti-theft device. Suddenly, if someone tries to steal your car, 
the car will know that it's not the rightful driver who has lit the ignition and will probably stall it and not let you drive away. So that sounds really like a useful application for it. But there's more. Okay, so what if we have uh, a million cars on the road, all of which have the seat, have this device in the seat so that you can actually datafy the seat. Well, suddenly, imagine if, if you could actually take the data from all of those drivers and you could run the regressions and you could find out what is the subtle cues and shift of posture 30 seconds before an accident, right? If you can find that out, maybe you will have datafied driver fatigue and the service there then would be to take the data and when it sees that there's the likelihood of an accident, it would send you an internal alert inside the car. So maybe the steering wheel would vibrate or you'd hear a chime or a honk. Know to wake up and pay more attention to the road. So it actually could be road safety as well. The data would have been generated for one purpose, the purpose of an anti-theft device, used for a secondary purpose, in this case, to prevent accidents. And these are the sorts of things that are possible when we take things that are informational, even if we didn't think of it as information before, datafy it, and then use big data techniques with it. Right, now of course, more than one person drives the car, and eventually the car gets sold to someone else. So it, it strikes me that all of these concepts um, involve ongoing updating, ongoing collection. Um, you know, could you talk a little bit about like data life? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about breaking, breaking data out of companies systems that might be five years old, 10 years old, sometimes data is relevant going back that far and then other times it's not. Maybe that time continuum of, of data. Well, happily we have someone with us who is an expert on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's Victor, of course he wrote the book. His earlier book was Delete, The Virtue of Forgetting in a Digital Age. What, what is really interesting is that um, it is very, very important to uh, realize that in a big data age, uh, the, the value of data isn't exhausted uh, by using it for its primary purpose. So I collect data um, from you because you just bought a book from me online. Uh, and once I have sent you the book and you've paid the bill, then that primary purpose for which that data was collected has been fulfilled and I could throw the data away. But maybe not. Maybe I can uh, let the data uh, do double duty. Uh, and help me in uh, making recommendations uh, to you uh, about future books to buy. Um, that is a secondary use, that is a secondary purpose, um, and that is greatly increasing the value, the overall value that data has. Now, if that's the case, then there is a strong incentive for companies to preserve data. However, um, we need to be careful when we preserve data and preserve data uh, without a time limit, preserve data forever, because data also becomes irrelevant. Uh, data becomes outdated. And so think about book recommendations. If uh, you have 10 years of book recommendations, perhaps the uh, 10 years of book transactions that created book recommendations, then perhaps the transactions 10 years ago are not so meaningful anymore for current recommendations. But perhaps they are. Perhaps something that you bought eight years ago is really truly still relevant, but something that you bought six months ago is not. It might have been a gift to a girlfriend you, never, you no longer have. And therefore, what is so hard for uh, these uh, data holders is to find out what data is still relevant and what data isn't. Because if it's no longer relevant, then it's useful to forget it because otherwise it is noise that is drowning out the signal of the good data. And so we believe that the future will be one where we collect much more information and keep it for longer periods of time. But the really smart companies have really good ways of ensuring that they either discard or disregard data that has lost relevance. Yes, yes. That's, uh, that, I mean, that, to me, that strikes me as a, comp a whole discipline, you know, that we had in the federal government around records retention, mm -hmm. you know, archives, mm -hmm. and, and this whole concept of, you know, how long do we keep something and when do we throw it out? And it, it strikes me that now that we're collecting data about everything, you know, and, we, and, and everyone brings up the issues of, of privacy and is all this data going to, you know, predict the future and somehow be used against me, um, I would like to kind of get into that 
with an eye toward this, you know, this delete concept mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. Um, Ken, would you like to start with this, the, the dark side of all of this and some of the concerns that people obviously have? Sure. So privacy is a concern. No doubt about it. It seems like the tools that we have, the techno technological tools of anonymization don't work very well in a big data age. Right. At the same time, the policy tools we have, the legal tools such as the consent of notice and regime at the time, excuse me, notice and consent at the time of collection don't work as well either in a big data age. So these things are winnowing, but there's something else still. And that is not privacy, but propensity. Algorithms that are predicting our behavior for things that we're likely to do, but might not, and then perhaps we'll be penalized for in in before we've actually committed the infraction. And this is actually relatively new in jurisprudence. We don't have experience with this. So what is the thing we need to guard? Well, probably our free will, our individual volition, because you can imagine that if someone is denied an, a surgical operation because they say that there's a 95% mortality rate at this person's age group uh, you know, within two years of the operation, so the insurance will not pay, you might say, well, I'll certainly be a part of the 5% that will live. I deserve the operation. And of course, all 100 people would make that claim, and so it becomes a difficult social issue. Mm -hmm. Yes, very difficult. Yes, Victor. And, and then on the on the privacy side, uh, we, we're really uh, challenged by this um, big data age. You know, we in this country and elsewhere in the world, um, we we have sort of come to accept the idea of notice and consent, um, even though it has become very formulaic almost. So that that you go to a website and you get a long notice, and then you have to click on agree. Now. You know, you could argue that that's not really informed consent. You just never read those 28 pages of privacy notices that, that you've been given. But the really interesting, the really important thing here is that this is notice and consent at a time of collection. And that means that at the time of collection, I, as the data user, need to tell you for what purposes I'm going to use the data. But I don't. In the big data age, the real value is in the secondary uses that I have no idea of at the time of collection. So notice and consent fails to protect us because either um, I have to go back for every secondary use to the individual and ask for consent again. That's not going to work. Think of Google had to go back to billions of people uh, around the world asking them for consent about the flu trends. That would have been impossible. Or people have to give consent in such general terms that it doesn't mean anything anymore. And so we need to come up with some other way to protect people's privacy because protecting privacy is very important. And in this big data age, we suggest in the book that the way to do that is not to look at the collection side, but to look at the use side. Because it's not so much the problem that we collect data, it's what we use the data for. And we want to have accountability of data use. Right, so let's use an example. I was struck in the book by the example where 50% of the parole boards use big data techniques to inform them as to which people are most likely to, um, should be released as opposed to not. Hmm. What, what, what's the detail behind that? I mean, how did that, how did, how, how, how do they feel comfortable doing that? And are people, are people aware that this is how they're being judged? Well, first of all, it's not actually big data techniques. They're big data-ish techniques. What they are are classic actuarial techniques. These actuarial techniques, looking at statistics and looking at you know, past behavior to predict future behavior, has been around for a while. The difference now is that we're able to do it at a much vaster scale uh, in six-tenths of a second for ze oh, essentially zero cost. Right? So that's a very useful thing. What's, so what we're using the parole board example to do is look at the direction that things are headed in. Because that's still treating people like a group, a member of a group. It's not tailored down to the exact traits of a particular individual, perhaps with a thousand variables. This is a very blunt instrument. But that blunt instrument is very troubling. The reason why they're able to do that is because the perception is we are not penalizing someone. We are giving them the grant of early release from a penalty. 
remo removing them from prison. So that is how, that is the intellectual justification of why you would use this technique. But just as you would say, I'm going to price the premium of this